Morning, everyone. We're just letting everybody into the room. So we'll give it another minute. Um, before we start, actually, just a couple of house housekeeping uh, points. If It would be great to be able to see you. If that's possible, please switch your cameras on. That would be great from an engagement point of view. Um, and if you could all stay on mute, that would be great until the, the Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, and I should probably just say that I am Richard Muir. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce and a very warm welcome uh, to all of our delegates, speakers and partners this morning. Um, it's obviously nine o'clock UK time, 10 o'clock Germany time, as we've just been reminded by our German partners this morning, but all very warm welcome to the North Rhine-Westphalia um, Outward Mission from Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, focusing on renewable energy and green tech. We're delighted to have you all along and to build on yesterday morning's session uh, with Minister Ivan McKee and Minister Pinkvart, uh, led by Paul Little, our president. Great to see you all. And as, as we were talking about yesterday, we're delighted to be building on the partnership with North Rhine-Westphalia and on the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, that goes back to 2003 between the, 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 the countries and the regions. Um, and also, as Minister McKee reminded us yesterday, uh, we are already exporting a value of 2.5 billion uh, to Germany, and the plan over the next 10 years is to double that. So that's very much in mind with the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce's mission and international trade. And, and Glasgow Chamber of Commerce has been, uh, has been involved in international trade from the very inception in 1783. So it's part of our DNA and we're delighted to be uh, pulling this outward trade mission together. Of course, 2021 is going to be a very big year for Glasgow and for the world with COP26 coming to the city. And we're delighted to be building on that with today's session. And we have some very exciting plans in the run-up um, to COP26, and we will tell you more about that later. We'd also like to thank all of our partners uh, in Germany and in Scotland, um, and particularly to Scottish Government, to SDI, to Scottish Chambers of Commerce, and to Brit the British Consulate as well. Uh, and I'll come on and thank some other partners as we go along this morning. So obviously from our point of view today, the, the, the session is uh, going to be quite interactive with time for Q&A. Please use the chat function. We're recording the session for internal purposes only. Um, but the, 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 the session's objective is to get insight into the renewable energy and green tech sectors in both Scotland and in Germany. We're pl pleased to have both German and Scottish companies joining us this morning. We're delighted to have so many excellent speakers today. And we're really looking forward to learning more about the current sector opportunities in both the countries. The way the session is going to work is firstly, we're going to focus on Germany, and then we're going to hear what's going on in the renewable sector over, uh, over there first, and then we'll move on to Scotland. Um, as I say, just a quick reminder that the session is being recorded, and if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A function. Uh, again, I'd like to thank Energy Agenteur, uh, the local energy agency in NRW, who we've been working with on this mission. And thank you particularly to Magdalena and the team who've done an excellent job in pulling together all of the B2B meetings. And I believe we've got over 26 one-to-one -one B2B meetings. Uh, I'd also like to give a thanks to Alexandra Steen, who's the director of the Scottish Government Hub in Germany, and Johannes Augustin, who's the senior representative for SDI for all the work they've put into the mission as well. And I believe they'll be joining us on the call today uh, and can provide excellent in-market support, support for the Scottish businesses following the mission. So it's my pleasure now to hand over to Stefanus Lintka, Head of International Relations and Foreign Trade Activities at the Energy Agency in NRW. He'll be providing us with an overview of the renewables industry in Germany as a whole, and then more specifically on North Rhine-Westphalia. So Stefanus, over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Richard uh, and uh, all of you, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give some information about the energy transition and some industry effects and parts of, of renewable energies. Um, I just will open my presentation. A few seconds this way. And I have to change it. Yeah. 
Okay, now it should be seen very well, I hope. That's good. Okay, let's let's start. Yeah, a warm welcome again uh, um, to, to a short ride, hurry ride <laughs> through the, the energy topic in Germany and in our state. Uh, um, and well, it's, it's very important and it's uh, uh, data and uh, um, parameters on an actual actual time frame. Uh, I will give you some aspects in my presentation. Uh, yes, my name is Stefan Ninke. I'm head of the international department of the agency. I'm working for this agency since uh, well, 17, 18 years. Uh, I was head of the wind uh, cluster, of the geothermal cluster in this agency, and now I'm responsible together with uh, Magdalena uh, for our international relations. Um, Yes, um, just some framework information. You know this. This is well. This is especially for for Germany. This is this uh, transformation process. We call it energy transition. Uh, uh, you see, we are moving from the fossil age, or in Germany especially, also from the nu uh, nuclear age to to a renewable uh, time frame. Uh, means uh, that we are phasing out nuclear. We are focusing on renewable energy technologies and especially also on energy efficiency. And what is what is new since two years, we are also facing our coal here in Germany. It's not so new for your side, uh, uh, but for us, it's very, very new and very important because this is nearly our own or really the, the, the local resource we have. We have no oil, we have less gas or less oil and less gas, but coal is very important. This means in the year 2050, it's now maybe 2045, we have some new framework condition from our Supreme Court last week uh, that we have to be much faster and that we have to do in this generation, in my generation, much more than in the, the future generation. So this could mean that we have also no fossil fuel I'm not quite sure. I believe we will have some gas uh, supply, uh, but the focus is on renewables. Um, all this is under the framework condition of Kyoto and the sustainable goals and Paris Agreement. And as you mentioned, Richard, uh, the COP is also very important in that uh, situation. So at the COP in, in, in Glasgow, I think we will finalize and fix some more uh, data and timelines. Yeah, this is the situation in Germany. Uh, well, as I mentioned, the focus on renewables, uh, phasing out nuclear in 2022. So at the end of last next year, we will have no more or no nuclear power plant uh, in the grid system. Uh, they are there. Dismantling is also a time frame from 30 or 40 years here in Germany. So we will see. Efficiency is a big, big strategy. Uh, all this with the focus on carbon emission reduction and with carbon emission reduction, we have the phasing out of uh, the coal firing situation in, in Germany. And you see the small graph on the left side. This shows uh, the time slide for every year phasing out coal. I would say this is old. This is from two years ago, but this today, this is old. We have to go much faster uh, and we will see <coughs> whether we can reach it in 2035 and not 2038 as it was estimated before. So this is the situation, but what you see also on this graph, we have two big power situation in nuclear in the Northern part and in the Southern part and in the Western and in the Eastern part, not mentioned here, we have the coal fire power plant. So this is quite interesting. This uh, has an influence on grid, sit on the grid situation. This. Uh, brings us some problems uh, uh, focusing on renewable energies. Yeah, this is a development over the last, let's say, 20 years. Um, uh, uh, you see at the top uh, nuclear and below hard coal and lignite are phasing out. Uh, gas looks like it's keep a little bit growing as an intermediate uh, 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 system. Then we have um, on the same level over the years, uh, hydro and bioenergy. Wind is growing. This is a 
most successful technology here in our state or in Germany in general because we have the situation of, of offshore, uh, but there are also some excellent sites onshore. Uh, we have in the northern part no mountain range, so the wind can blow from the northy directly to the windmills without any barrier. Well, in solar, yes, it's, it's growing and especially for our state here, solar could be a big strategy because we have enough place, we have enough rooftops uh, to implement solar here in, in our area. So that's the situation. It's 100%. 100% means uh, that's not the same total amount. We have today around 80 gigawatt installed capacity. But if we're focusing on the renewable side, we need doubling this volume. Some expert said it could be also uh, 200 gigawatt installed capacity. We would see. Together with this, together with the change um, to the renewable or with the transformation to the renewable side, we have a reduction on greenhouse gas emission. That's the main framework today. Uh, but you see on the right side, the last column, we have to meet a target by 65% in 2030. Whether we will reach this target, I'm not quite sure. Um, that's the reason why we are discussing to, to go out uh, of uh, coal-fired power plants much earlier. But what does this mean, for example, for our state here, North Rhine-Westphalia, you see it in the small uh, picture. Um, we are responsible here in our area for nearly 30, 35% of the greenhouse gas emission in Germany. Well, in other words, without progress in our state, Germany can't fulfill their uh, CO2 promises, uh, so reduction promises. So that's that's quite interesting. So we have to do a lot here in our state, uh, and I will give you some information about this later. Yes, if we're talking about renewables, you can see here four four pictures. Uh, all side, uh, slides or uh, elements show Germany, but with different technologies, where are these technologies available, where are the power plants up to bigger than 10, 10 megawatt installed capacity. And you see from left to right, uh, biomass and hydro is, let's say, uh, all around Germany. Hydro is a little bit more in the south because we have the mountain range, we have the Alps, um, so hydro is there available. In the western part, it's more the bioenergy friction because we have your farmland and we can use the biomass. Wind power, it's on and offshore, especially in the northern part. Uh, uh, there are the natural resources uh, um, onshore, well, all over Germany, not in the Bavarian, in, 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 in the southern part. Um, I give you some arguments later why this happens. Um, this has sometimes, uh, this is, is um, sometimes based on natural resources, but it's mostly based on political reasons. Uh, PV, it's more in the eastern part. There are the bigger one, bigger power plants, uh, the, 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 the surface power plants, several gigawatts uh, and, and 100 megawatts. It's not so in, in the western and the southern part. And if you're looking on the conventional side, you can see we have most in our region, in the western area of Germany, the coal fire power plants and more in the, in the eastern part, uh, there are the lignite resources. Uh, in the south and in the north, it's more the gas uh, fraction of, of uh, conventional power. Um, so natural resources means also industry. So going from right to left now from the conventional side, we in our state, we have a huge knowledge about energy technology and energy uh, uh, research. This is because we are, we are working since several hundred years in these uh, topics. Energy is part of our, our, our life here in our area. Uh, looking to the wind side, um, yes, in the northern part, it's like in Scotland, you have uh, all the logistic hubs for offshore, you have uh, um, um, a lot of companies uh, uh, producing blades uh, and so on. And more in the middle and in the Western part, we have more the, the, the steel components. Um, 
because here we have the steel companies like Tusen Krupp in our area uh, uh, producing towers and steels and wires and so on. So this is a little bit uh, the situation in wind, yes, and hydro in, in the biomass sector. Well, you can find all over Germany companies working on, on biomass power plants uh, and so on. This is a smaller business scale. So you find also in this case, uh, smaller companies. Hydro is a little bit uh, complicated. Uh, there are no more producers for small hydro in Germany. Uh, big hydro is Siemens uh, on Freud. Uh, they are based in the southern part of Germany, but but small hydro is more um, repowering of old mills uh, and, and, and old and small uh, water power uh, systems. Together with this, if you change your energy system, you have also a view on transportation. Uh, 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 and we have now the problem, not in east-west problem with the cold situation, cold fire power plants, we have a north-south situation. We have in the northern part, uh, the wind turbines and in the southern part, the solar situation, a good solar situation. So how to uh, uh, meet the consumers, uh, uh, how to fulfill the demand side. And there's a big, big program in Germany to build uh, a, a better grid. Uh, um, there are four major directions, uh, north-south, uh, nearly parallel uh, to meet uh, the big industry centers that's in our area here, the Ruhr Valley, the Rhine Valley, and it is in the southern part, the, the chemical side around Ludwigshafen and Mannheim, so that's, uh, that's more in the south. Uh, so this is a, a very huge challenge, um, but we have to, to solve this, and as you see, it takes long. Uh, uh, um, there are estimations about 15 to 20 years to, to reach uh, um, this uh, a very good situation to transport wind from the north to the south. Yes, to, to sum up a little bit, um, this is done by Agora Energiewende and Fraunhofer, some, some research institutes. And you see it's, it's not all gold, yeah? It's less silver or platinum. Uh, uh, um, they said uh, we have to do much more. Uh, uh, we are too slow to displace to displace the fossil fuels. Uh, we miss efficiency targets here in Germany, uh, and we also miss the, the climate targets in 2020. And yeah, to summarize, uh, we need much better technical infrastructure. Uh, um, we need some more incentives and investments, uh, and we need uh, uh, more uh, ambition for, for our targets. So that's a little bit the frame from Germany. It's a good progress. Um, it's uh, well organized, but at the end, the results, well, it could be better. A little bit to our state now. Um, uh, Mr. Pinkbutt mentioned I think some, some economic data yesterday. So we are uh, um, uh, the industrial power state, economic powerhouse in Germany, but we are also the energy powerhouse. And I go just forward. Uh, we are producing here nearly 20, 27% of Germany's electricity. So we here in our state, we means in NRW, but we are also consuming this amount. So actually we are, uh, um, zero, not a net producer and a net consumer, it's, it's zero. But we have a lot of power capacity here installed, no nuclear, most fossil, and we have to move to, to more renewables and reduce our fossil capacities. We also have a focus on, on the, the employee sector. Many people are working here in our state in this sector because this is over 150 years, uh, the mining industry, the coal industry, and the energy industry. Uh, some, some details. In Germany, we have actually, in, in, at the end of 2020, around 49% of uh, renewables uh, uh, on the production side in our state we have 60 so you can compare we are we are 
much slower or on the other side we are coming from a completely different energy system we are coming from from a cold based energy system uh, uh, and to, to transfer this takes takes much longer and has dramatic dramatic changes uh, or needs dramatic changes for the industry to cover this and to have a strategy on this, uh, the government uh, published in 2019 energy supply strategy, the local government. This was the more bottom-up process with the stakeholders. This was quite interesting. So the big industry partners like the chemical industry as well as the, the, the energy producing industry, the power industry, they were involved. And um, well, here are some results. Um, not surprising, reduction of CO2 emissions in the energy sector by 70%. This must be more since the, 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 the decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, the focus on renewables, uh, um, doubling, nearly doubling the wind power capacity in our state to 10.5 gigawatt, and uh, really a big progress in the PV uh, situation up to 11.5 gigawatt. I have to say these are targets. Whether we will reach them, we, we will see. Uh, shutdown of coal fired power plants uh, until 2035. Uh, maybe it should be a little bit earlier, but well, we will see. So the focus is on wind, PV, CHP, so combined heat and power with gas. So I mentioned before, gas is not out of the market. Geothermal energy, especially for heating supply of houses and so green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is a hype uh, also in our state. Uh, uh, and we will see whether we will reach this. We will have this, um, this information from Carsten later. Maybe he give, can give us some more, more hints. Yes, one big focus on hydrogen is the hydrogen roadmap. So we have a hydrogen roadmap in our state to, to define a framework on this. Uh, and uh, the focus here for our state is on trucks and buses uh, and ships uh, as well to use hydrogen in, in the big industry for power and heat production. Um, we have some companies here available uh, producing components uh, uh, and uh, we want to transfer some industry parts uh, um, and keep jobs in the energy sector with this focus on hydrogen. There are excellent boundaries here in our area. We have a hydrogen pipeline. We have uh, um, hydrogen as a waste product from the chemical industry. So uh, a lot of things are available for, for a very good start. Uh, I skipped this because a little bit too, inf inf too much information, yes. Just looking back on the situation, what are the, what are the targets and what are the facts on the market? Uh, you can see here from uh, the situation in wind energy, uh, our state was the front runner in, wind, in the wind industry in the 90s of the last century. Then there was a gap and at the, in, in the years 2010 and following there was a good progress. And in 2017, the state of North Rhine-Westphalia was failure was number two or number one in additional install annual installation of wind power in Germany. Whether we have no offshore, whether we have no coastline, but there was a common and incentive uh, uh, program uh, um, together with, with the communities, together with the uh, uh, wood, woodland owners, together with the farmers to, to, to build up wind mills. But you can see here in these figures uh, in 2070, we have a government changed and it drops dramatically down um, because uh, there is a big influence, especially on the regulation side from the politics uh, in the wind sector. And uh, well, we hope that uh, with this pressure from, from the view of climate protection, uh, we have now the bottom of the valley and we can go, go further on and uh, grow, can grow the, the wind uh, installation. But that's a little bit the problem to have political targets, but without 
framework and, and uh, supporting conditions behind. Uh, I will skip this through. Yeah, so these are now Germany in our state, North Hemisphere. Just some, some slides, only some slides about what we are doing in this uh, field. We are the agency, we are working since 30 years in this market, and it was the idea just to transfer the coal-based power situation uh, to a renewable-based power situation. And this was the idea for 30 years before. And we are working on this field as an independent uh, operational platform financed by, by government. Uh, uh, um, and well, it's technical aspect, it's research, it's networking, it's international work like we are doing here. So these are our, our services. You can see it here. We have several networks on solar, on wind, on geothermal energy, on hydrogen. Uh, we are talking with communities about energy efficiency programs. We are starting market initiatives for heat pumps, for new solar modules. Uh, and we are talking about this and you will find a lot of information I, I showed you uh, and, and you are in discussion now uh, on our internet pages. There are millions of paper sheets <laughs> we have uh, 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 and uh, you find nearly all what's, what's going on in the energy market except nuclear. So because we are not working in the field of nuclear, uh, this is not uh, in our program. Yeah, here you can find other, other um, te technical uh, topics. Uh, it's nearly all uh, uh, in, in our work. All this is headed by, by, by um, key people. They are, they are very well linked to, to industry, linked to research, linked to the politics. So these are all, all cluster structures. Yes, only some works, uh, just three slides. Uh, for example, in the wind industry, uh, we started, uh, as I said, in the 19th of the last century. Then we had a gap. Then we, we started with a, well, with a, with, a, with a progress also on the national level. And for example, this is one result of our work. We have a business directory in wind energy. We exchanges also with some colleagues in Scotland uh, for, uh, working in the market uh, as developers just to find partners. It's just a written B2B possibility. Uh, on the other hand, here we are working in the, in the fuel cell and hydrogen sector with a, also with a focus on the e-mobility. Uh, we have a network uh, with more than 500 members uh, and 100 project partners, mostly SMEs. And we are managing this as a cluster in our states, uh, also with a link to the international uh, uh, cluster world, to, to Japan, to, to the Netherlands. We hope we are just in discussion with partners in Scotland just to, to have this relation. Uh, yeah, mobility is a big point, uh, whether it's uh, e-based or hydrogen-based, uh, we have here in our area, some refueling stations. Uh, uh, with we as an agency, we have an own uh, hydrogen car. So we are working on this and uh, are part of also a national program. Here are some results. Uh, as I said, trucks and buses are uh, is in our focus, and uh, we see. Um, a big rollout, especially for fuel cell buses in our area, um, and, and that's a big program. Yes, I would say at first this is what I would like to show you, framework condition, the regional situation, our state, and some project information. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Stefanos. That was excellent. A great insight uh, overview of the renewable sector in both Germany and NRW. Um, and clearly, like everyone, we all need to be more ambitious and invest more. Um, great to hear that NRW is the energy powerhouse. Um, and I think you've outlined the dramatic changes which are required in the industry. And I'm sure a lot of the delegates will be particularly interested 
uh, in the hydrogen roadmap and also a lot of the international relationships which you're building across the globe in places like Japan and Netherlands. So lots to discuss and lots of relationships to build. So thank you for that excellent overview. Uh, in a second, I'm going to hand over to Carsten Kraus. Carsten is the Chief Executive uh, Officer of Elegen, uh, and we're going to get a case study from Carsten. After Carsten has spoken, we're going to hear from Nick. Nick Sharp is the Director of Communications and Strategy at Scottish Renewables. Um, and then we're going to get a case study uh, and an overview um, from Steve Taylor, who's the Chief Exec of Ideas. And Steve is now currently working in Berlin on a project which he's going to tell us more about as well. So in the meantime, can I hand over to Carsten uh, and we'll get the case study from Carsten. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you also for the introduction of all these matters from, from Stefan. So I will go deeper in the, in, into the field of, of green hydrogen. And I will tell you the story yeah, about our company and NRW, green hydrogen and also projects yeah, with uh, options for you as a Scottish uh, company. So first, maybe to know a bit more about uh, our company. So, so Elogen, um, so we develop uh, PEM electrolyzer. So I come later, so we have a history. So starting in, in, in 2000, so it's not a new company, Elogen as itself, it's a quite new company. So from February, this is a new name. So, so we have a very strong DNA on, on, on the stack development, uh, the, the heart of the electrolyzer. And uh, we build up the, the systems and, and provide this to, into projects and to, to customers. So yeah, this is maybe a good story because so we are in, in fact, we are a French company. So maybe you said, well, who is talking about? Because I thought it's maybe a German company. So we are a French company. And uh, I started my, my mission in, in, in Elogen. It was Areva h 2 gen before in end of 2014. And they said, okay, Carsten, so you could be the guy we need for Germany because in the field of green hydrogen or hydrogen at the cells, it's very interesting to have uh, somebody for the German market. And it's, it's a must to, to be in Germany if, if, if you're going for business in, in, in Europe. So I started my, 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 uh, my business. And a few months later in April 15, we found a GmbH because we said, okay, it's, 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 it's better to have a GmbH instead of, of uh, be only a, a sales agent or a business development agent. So now our home base is in, in Les Olis, it's in, in Greater Paris. There we have a, a small factory, there we have the headquarters, the R&D, and also the production side. So we have 50 um, employees in, in, in Les Olis. And my team, I started with, with one, so we are now seven. And, I, and um, with, with his um, colleagues, we go into, into projects in Germany and we are going for sales. And today we be going for sales all over the world from, from Germany. So I go with my sales team from, from, uh, yeah, from Germany out, uh, out into the world. And we have a strong uh, sales partner in, in, in London. So this is Ian, yeah. And um, yeah, so we, we, we sold already the electrolyzer in the last 15 years into continents. Uh, so, so we are going around the world. And um, here you see the story. So we st Areva H2Gen was found in 14. There was another company before. So, and now we have this joint venture and we have a new shareholder. This is GTT. And I go through because so maybe then we have more time for the more interesting things. GTT is a company, but you see also here the, the DNA there is to have uh, the, the, the knowledge for, for storage systems for LNG. In, in ships and in container ships. So they sell the, the, um, yeah, the knowledge, the IP um, to all the producers of these container ships for the LNG. And uh, GTT at, at itself is also a small company with 500 employees, 80% are engineers and technicians. So you see it's a very high technology impact. 20% are in the field of uh, R&D. Yeah, and now we, we're going and this is a our philosophy, our DNA um, to go through. So I will 
I will script it. So we are, where are our markets here in, 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 in Germany, also in Europe, but there's a very strong phase in, in, in Germany at the moment, in France and, and UK. So we are in the mobility sector. So we have uh, for smaller fueling stations, I come back to this uh, later. Then we have a, a strong impact power to gas. So you see also the, the, the wind, uh, wind farms we have, as Stefan mentioned it, and the, to produce uh, also hydrogen to bring it into the grid as poor hydrogen or to, to mix it with, with the natural gas and power to power solutions. So interesting, we have a project in, in, in Orkney Islands where we have a power to power project. It's interesting. <laughs> so we produce the hydrogen and then, then there will be partner to, with a fuel cell to produce electricity. So we are part of, uh, you know, it better than me than the Orkney Islands. They are, I guess in the end, there are three huge projects for hydrogen in, in this field. So we, we have, uh, yeah, we are going in, in, in Scotland for this project and heavy industry also. Um, yeah, so we have a very strong impact. Maybe you heard it a few days ago. So we have this IPSI project in Europe and they opened it uh, for Germany. And there we have a very strong impact in refineries and steel factories. They will go now for huge projects with 20, 50, 100 or even more electrolyzer capacity to produce green steel. Yeah, so what are our products? So we have. Uh, First, we go for, for container solutions, smaller ones uh, you see later, like uh, one megawatt or even smaller two megawatt. Then we go with, with partners for this electrolyzer plants. So maybe this is a project I mentioned, 20, 40, 50 megawatt. So these are upcoming. And um, also, yeah, we, we bring the service. And maybe also to, to, to combine it with a, with a <laughs> With the words uh, Stefan said, so the green hydrogen is a hype. I started in, in 2015. I said, so six years ago, and then we thought, oh, one megawatt is big and huge, and, and nobody produced this. And now, five years later, yeah, it's, it's a real hype. And then one megawatt, two megawatt is you know, going out, not, not daily, but it's, it's quite common. And there's a strong focus on five, 10 megawatt, and also the bigger projects with, with 20, 50, 100 megawatt even. They started now. Yeah, these are our concept. So this is interesting, maybe also for you or for, for the companies. So on one hand, so our main purpose are the stacks. This is the IP. So we our DNA, we go for the stacks. We will go for, for a new stack factory in, in France. We said, okay, this is our knowledge. And then we have uh, two, two, two ways. One is the container systems. I mentioned up to five megawatt, maybe 10 megawatt. So you have a container solution indoor or outdoor. So these are our products. So we, we go for the stacks, we go for the engineering, for the design, um, yeah, for the, for, the, for the purchase of, of, of the products, of the material. But then in the end, we have a subcontractor. So a company who builds the container and, and, and the piping and all these, and this could be uh, also a partner, uh, if we go to, uh, to, to Scotland, we have a partner in Scotland, so he can do it. We have a partner in Spain, maybe. So if you have a Spanish product, so then it's, it's closer to the end customer. And even if you have a funded project, it's, it's nicer even in Germany to have a German partner because then they said, okay, there's a, a lot of German impact in this electrolyzer because we are out of France. And on the other hand, if we go for this larger uh, project for 20, 40, 50, uh, 60 megawatt, then we have a strong EPC partner. So we go for the stacks. Uh, we deliver the stacks, but not only the stacks. We deliver also, uh, yeah, like uh, the engineering and parts of the design, because then we come from the process, from the electrolyzer process, and the EPC is coming from 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 the view to to build big big factories. So these are the models. So you see even, and I guess also other companies from, from in, in, in our field, they are going quite similar ways, you see. So they are open positions for, for, for customers. And you see German and European government are supporting hydrogen. Okay, I, and why I'm in, in Cologne. So we are based in Cologne 
because of yeah, on one story is I guess Stefan mentioned it. It's it's uh, the story of Northern Westphalia. This is the leading the leading uh, county in, in in Germany for 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 this hydrogen. And myself, I'm I'm involved in this hydrogen for now exactly 20 years. So I know the energy agency and I know all these projects. And we settled up uh, with Heiko Loan projects for these buses. And yeah, for me, it was no question if we if we go to to or if we if we if we go for a company in Germany, we go to Cologne because on the other hand, excellent. This is uh, Stefan didn't mention, but uh, if you if you settle down, it's it's great for me because from here I can go to Paris by train in in Germany by train to to every every city we have airports Cologne Düsseldorf, so you can fly to to yeah wherever you want. So it's it's fantastic. And it's one of the best base you could have in in in, in Germany. And uh, yes, I mentioned so we have a, a very strong focus on all these hydrogen projects. It's in, it's a strategy. We have a strategy in Northern Westphalia. We have a strategy in Germany. We have a lot of funding. In the end, nine billion. So it's amazing. Yeah. And um, now it's it's new for the last two years. The, the high impact for industry, for refineries and, and steel, I said. And uh, yeah, and then we have this exchange Stefan mentioned. So we have in, in, in Germany, we have we going out of coal, we will have much more wind. And then we have this transition from to bring the wind energy from the north coast to, yeah, to Bavaria, to the south in Germany. And this transition is going on. So we will have in the end, we will have much more. We have pipelines. So we produce hydrogen to bring the hydrogen into, into this, this pipeline to the other counties, Northern Westphalia or Bavaria. So there's even a strong, very strong power to gas impact. Yeah, and um, so we have a good base, also legal basis. So I, I go further because I have a few other interesting things to tell. So these are projects, um, you see, for us, it was interesting as a French company with our German subsidiary to, to join German projects with this GmbH. This was the reason why we have a GmbH and not only a, a private sales agent sitting at home. So I guess in the end, it would be, would be perfect to have an, an own company, even if it's one or two employees. But then you have an impact and you can join projects, uh, funded projects in Germany. And via these projects, you have also opportunities to go yeah, to find other partners. So MassQuest is one project where we have flexibility. We have a one megawatt delivery a few months or not. It's not delivered, but it's in, in process for delivery. And then you see a few things. This is in France, but now we have a few projects upcoming and um, where we go. And then I have to tell the last the last slide. This is a project, yeah, we, 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 we did together with a Scottish company, with Logan Energy, you know this company. So Logan Energy is a very strong partner for us. So even we go in Scotland uh, with Logan Energy together and then they are the local partner with all the advantage you have. And um, yeah, this is very imp uh, important. And on the other side, it, there's a project here in Germany. It's it's almost necessary to have a German partner, even if it's a, if it's a tendering, because yeah, if if something is in Germany, it, it's in German. A tender is in German, and yeah, you need a German partner for for the laws. And um, yeah, this is very important, even if if you go further for the regulation or if you have a partner, even if it's in the end uh, for the service. Uh, of, of this project you can do it maybe once a year but if, 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 if there's a service in between could be it could be great to have a partner in Germany and even if you go for maybe for projects there will be the next year a lot of projects coming up with uh, with funding then it's even important to have a German partner and not not only a, yeah, a Scottish partner yeah so this is a project here in, in Saarbrücken Isis is part of a European big GenCom project. So in the end, it's, it's a connection of an electrolyzer and a fueling station. So this is uh, uh, these two containers. They are connected to a solar panel. And in the end, they produce uh, the, yeah, 
the hydrogen in the container and then, then you have a filling. So in, in this project, we delivered the electrolyzer skit. Um, in this project, we produced this in, in France and then we delivered this to, to, to Logan Energy in Scotland, built in Scotland and then yeah, built up in Saarbrücken in, in, in southwest of, uh, of, of, of Germany. Yeah, this is very interesting project. And you see also, I know it from, from tendering. So we go with Logan, for example, for other projects, for fueling station, for example, they are open mind in, 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 in Germany for partner out of UK, especially Scotland. Uh, you have a very good reputation. So I can't say the companies where we are in contact, uh, but we have a very good reputation and there are much more projects coming up. But I guess it's necessary to have in the end to have partners. You can find it directly, or you can you can you can find it via uh, energy agency also to find companies that have a they have a digital platform. You can see maybe North and West failure. I don't know. There are a few hundreds companies in. So if you if you are looking for partners, yeah, and you have the connection to 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 the energy agency. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> So thank you very much. And this is my contact. And don't hesitate if you have any question. Yeah, coming back to me. Thanks. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Carson. Thank you for keeping to time. And thank you for a fascinating case study, which I'm sure all of our delegates will be very, very interested in. Um, the, the big takeaway for me there was, was partnerships. And it was great to hear about the, the way the com company's configured and the fact you're a French company, but you're a German subsidiary. And we talked a little about that in yesterday's session, some of the options for, for Scottish businesses setting up. But excellent to hear about your project in Orkney and obviously your partnership with Logan. And I think Nick is on the call from Logan today. I um, can't see my full screen at the moment, but I'm sure he's on the call. Um, so, so many fascinating aspects to the presentation, and I'm sure that really has inspired uh, all the delegates. So thank you so much for that. And um, if you have any questions for either Stefan or Carsten, please put them in the chat. Um, I know there's one or two that are coming in. I'm going to let the Scottish speakers uh, do their presentations and then we'll have time for the Q&A at the end. Um, but, but some really good feedback <clears throat> already in the chat. So thank you to both Stefan and Carsten for their contributions. I'm now going to ask Nick, the Director of Communications <clears throat> and Strategy from Scottish Renewables, to give us an overview of uh, renewables industry in Scotland. And I think Carsten's presentation neatly dovetails into, into what Nick's going to talk about now as well. So Nick, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, it certainly does dovetail very well. And um, message I put in the chat there about Stefan's presentation as well. Uh, there's so much similarity between what's going on in NRW and what's going on in Scotland. Um, even in terms of scale, so yeah, a, a lot of similarities. Uh, so I'll talk about a bit of that as well. But good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, as uh, as Richard said, uh, I'm director of communications and strategy at Scottish Renewables. I've been at SR for just over seven years, so hopefully now I've got a fair grasp on what the industry does in Scotland and what Scottish Renewables does as an organisation. So this morning, um, I'll give you a, a quick introduction to Scottish Renewables. Um, I'll tell you where we are now in Scotland in terms of renewable energy and then some of the key opportunities for the next kind of five to 10 years. One of those, uh, obviously, uh, is hydrogen. Um, another one is obviously COP, which has been mentioned, COP26 coming to Glasgow in November. So uh, at the end, I'll talk a bit about um, how we're getting involved with that um, and the message that we want to give to the world as well. So I don't want to dwell on the early section because I've got quite a lot of policy um, and uh, technology detail to get through. So Saren is kindly doing my slides for me because I'm terrible at this stuff. So thank you, Saren. Um, Scottish Renewables is the trade organization for renewable energy in Scotland. We represent about 260 companies um, working in all renewable energy technologies. We're un unique in the UK in representing businesses in every technology. So everything from the obvious wind power and solar through to uh, innovative technologies like marine energy, so wave and tidal power. Um, we represent energy storage companies. Uh, I know we have one of those on the call today. So hi, Ruth. Uh, we represent companies who, uh, who spend time thinking about our grid and networks and how we get power from generators to market. 
Um, and yeah, offshore wind is a huge thing for us and floating wind too, um, as, as a subsector of that. I'll talk a bit about that later, but that's something that's really coming through now. About two thirds of our membership are developers. So people that actually build projects, the rest are the supporting infrastructure that make that happen. So things like um, financiers, uh, insurance brokers, environmental planners, um, lawyers, uh, all those kind of businesses that support uh, the industry. Um, so and if you could skip on, that would be great. In terms of this is where we are in Scotland in terms of renewable power at the moment. So we've grown our renewable electricity generating capacity threefold in the last decade. We've got about 12 gigawatts of capacity now installed. Uh, and we're at a place where 97.4% of uh, our electricity cuts consumption comes from renewable sources. Um, that's up from 44% when I joined Scottish Renewables in 2013. So I won't take full credit for that, but uh, hopefully <laughs> a little bit of that is down to me. 97.4% though is incredible. Um, we did think that we might hit, we had a target of hitting 100% by 2020. We'll find out at the end of this year if, we've, if we hit that target or not. But regardless, that is a tremendous achievement. Um, it might sound great, uh, but we've hardly scratched the surface on decarbonizing heat, um, which is where hydrogen comes in to some extent. Um, heat's half the energy we use in Scotland. Scotland's quite a cold country, as you probably know. Uh, and we've got lots to do on transport as well. Transport's about a quarter of our energy use. So where does all that renewable power come from? Sarah, if you could skip on, please. Thank you. So onshore wind, the green section there, you'll see uh, is the biggest technology, uh, biggest single technology in Scotland. That's about 70% of our installed renewable electricity capacity. Well, offshore wind, that's the light blue section to the left, and hydropower and solar are the other major sources of renewable power. Um, our hydro sector has been around since the 1940s. Um, it was built after the war and, uh, and really... Um, kind of brought electricity to parts of Scotland that didn't exist, didn't have it before. Um, it was called the Power from the Glens campaign. So that hydro exists now. Um, I'll talk a bit more about hydro later on. The offshore wind section of that is about to increase dramatically. Uh, and again, I'll talk about some of the targets we've got there as well. There's also about 14 gigawatts of capacity. So more or less the same again, either in the planning system in Scotland or with planning consent already. But a lot of those schemes have, uh, have challenges um, in, in building out. So I can touch on that too. So we'll skip on to the technologies. So if you zip me through to the next one, that would be great. There we go. I love this picture. I keep using this picture um, just because I think it demonstrates the size of onshore. And that is an onshore turbine blade from probably five years ago. I mean, the scale of, of, of that now is, is, has been completely dwarfed by what we have now. Um, so onshore wind, uh, as I think Stefan reflected in uh, NRW, faces some policy problems and, and has, been, has had its challenges in the last five years. Um, it was thrown out of the energy system by the UK government after the 2015 election. Um, they ended the renewables obligation through which onshore wind was supported a year early and prevented it from competing in the replacement scheme, um, the contracts for difference mechanism. That caused massive disruption. And it's easy to see uh, when you look at a graph of, of employment and investment in renewables in Scotland, exactly what the damage that that decision did. Um, Scotland has two thirds of the UK's onshore wind. Um, we have about 10% of the UK's population, but two thirds of, it, of its onshore wind, primarily because we have the space and we have the wind resource. Scotland is the windiest country in Europe, um, which is a cool thing to say, but if you're out walking in the hills, uh, not particularly a cool thing to experience. So we fought for four and a half years to get onshore wind back in the energy system. That happened in March last year, just as coronavirus hit, um, which is great. But what that means is that a lot of the issues which were simmering away for four or five years have come back to the fore. Um, so we're dealing with a lot of those now, particularly around planning. Saren, if you could skip me on. Thank you. This is offshore wind. Um, that is the Beatrice project been installed up in Caithness. 
Um, we have about one gigawatt of offshore wind in Scotland at the moment, which isn't really much on the, the scale of the UK as a whole. The Scottish government believe that 11 gigawatts is possible by 2030. So we're looking to increase the amount of offshore wind we have tenfold in the next 10 years, um, which is dramatic. There's a, a leasing round for um, sites, parts of the seabed going on at the moment. So developers can bid in to, to lease part of the seabed from the Crown Estate and build projects there. Um, and we'll find out about around the end of this year um, who will be building those projects over the next 10 years. So that's really exciting. Uh, Seren Solar is next. I think not something people traditionally associate with Scotland. Um, costs, as we know, for solar projects have plummeted. Um, most projects, though, are facing government support issues. Um, there are two types of solar power. If you don't know that, the one in the picture on the right there, the majority of that picture is solar PV, which creates electricity from sunlight. And the small panel to the left is a solar thermal panel, which creates hot water from daylight too. Um, solar thermal has a, a real role to play in that transition to renewable heat that I was talking about earlier. Um, the map on the right is solar radiation. So you can see that most of Scotland is, uh, is quite poor for, um, for solar power, uh, but we do have much longer daylight hours than the rest of the UK, which, which gives an advantage there too. Um, next up is hydropower. As Stefan said earlier, uh, similar problems um, in, in the UK, I think, to, to Germany. Hydro really is dead in the water uh, at the moment. The small schemes have no support from UK government. So we've seen them completely dry up, if you excuse the pun. And the large schemes that the uh, project on the right there, um, in Scotland particularly, uh, the sites have, um, have really dwindled. We, we, a lot of those sites, the best sites have been developed so that there isn't much space for large projects. One thing that's worth mentioning is pumped storage hydro. Um, that's where you use water, uh, pump it uphill when you've got too much electricity and you reverse the flow and generate energy from it when you don't have enough electricity. Um, we've got great potential for that in Scotland, but again, at the moment, UK government not supporting it. It's very frustrating. Um, some of our members are pressing ahead anyway, though. Um, finally, on the technologies, Saren, uh, this is a renewable heat scheme in Glasgow. Um, provides hot water to 700 homes by burning wood pellets. Um, schemes like this are crucial for decarbonizing heat, linking up a number of buildings from dozens to hundreds of buildings with one or a few energy sources is a great way of reducing the carbon from heating. Um, it's very, very common uh, in the rest of Europe. Um, Denmark especially uh, has, has done great things on district heating. We're just not there yet. Um, the Heat Networks Act in Scotland has been passed in the last few months, though, so we're hoping for that to do big things. Um, that is my stuff on technology. You might think I've missed one. Uh, I haven't. I'm going to come to that in a second. Um, so, Saren, if you skip me on to the opportunities. So, uh, marine energy. Uh, many of you will know that Scotland leads the world in marine energy. Um, the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, uh, Carsten mentioned, mentioned Orkney earlier um, as well, is, is the, the place where more wave and tidal devices have been deployed than anywhere else in the world. Um, I didn't just put this slide here so I could use these amazing pictures of Orbital Marine Power's new Scottish built O2 turbine. That's the largest tidal turbine in the world. Um, Scotland, uh, as I say, yeah, really does lead in this stuff at the moment. The benefits of getting marine energy right are gigantic. Everywhere in the world has some kind of wave or tidal resource. Um, and we really hope that the UK government starts to recognise that potential and, and, and begins to support these technologies. Wave and tidal are in different places. Wave very much went back to the lab after the failure of two big companies back in 2015, Palamis and Aquamarine Power. Um, I think it's it's probably fair to say they went too far too fast and tried to build too big and um, couldn't handle the conditions in the sea with what they built. So Wave Energy is very much back in the lab and is supported by the Scottish government. Tidal, though, the project you see there, um, the O2 turbine, very much pressing ahead trying to reach commercial scale, but really lacking that um, UK government support. Um, 
the government are demanding that the sector reduces its costs before it builds out. But our message is look at what has happened in offshore wind. When you enable a project, a technology to build out, you reduce costs to a level that you never thought possible. Uh, and that, that's really what's happened in offshore wind. So we want to see tidal mirror that trajectory um, and commercialize. Uh, finally, on opportunities, the energy transition. Uh, yeah, and, and just a wee bit of hydrogen. Um, this encompasses so much. Uh, Stefan talked about the transition earlier. Um, in Germany, it seems from his presentation, moving very much from coal to renewables. In uh, Scotland, we talk about moving from the oil and gas industry that we have to low carbon uh, renewable power and, and how, the, how the jobs and the skills and the knowledge that exist in oil and gas can be brought across um, to things like offshore wind and renewable heat and hydrogen uh, and carbon capture to an extent as well. A um, lot of uncertainty still, I think it's fair to say about how that's going to happen. Um, we are working on a number of projects um, on the energy transition um, as our government and others. Um, so much been written on this subject. We have a, a North Sea transition deal at the moment that was struck between the, the uh, industry and the UK government. Um, that's looking at decarbonizing production in the North Sea. So how we get the oil and gas out of the ground, uh, what it's not looking at so much is decarbonizing what happens to those products when they get to the market. So um, in the year of COP, which I'll come to on the next slide, my final slide, in the year of COP, um, it's increasingly difficult for Scottish companies who uh, focus solely on oil and gas to get help from government. Um, our economic development agencies have now said they won't help companies um, who do oil and gas. That's been very difficult for, for them and for the companies themselves. Um, that's something we're working with, with both sides of that on. Um, where will the investment come from for the transition? Um, some of it will come from the public purse. Uh, we had a £62 million announcement last year from Scottish Government um, and, and more money through that transition deal too. But a lot of this has to come from private financing. And we know that oil and gas companies traditionally have very deep pockets. Their interventions in offshore wind have been quite dramatic recently and have, have, have changed the way that sector um, operates really. So uh, yeah, a lot of the, the financing for the transition needs to come from them. Um, and yeah, hydrogen, hydrogen has a huge role to play. You know, Scotland has this tremendous wind resource. We have the North Sea, uh, which is uh, pretty much undeveloped in terms of offshore wind at the moment um, with an active oil and gas base. And so we, we know that hydrogen will play a role in the future. We just don't quite know what that is yet. Um, almost certain to be transport and heavy industry, but how that plays into heat, um, we don't know at the moment. So conscious of time, um, I'll just skip on to my final slide, which is uh, COP26 in November, um, something that our members have been hugely excited about. I don't think I've ever seen so much enthusiasm and positivity about anything. Um, they all want to be involved. So we have a project that we set up to support them. Uh, that's Scottish Renewables Year of COP. Um, we've signed up a number of partners and sponsors and supporters. I've just noticed all of whom are not represented on this slide. I must fix that. Um, some of the things we're doing around COP reflect the UK government's ambition for what they wanted COP to be, which was more than just two weeks in November and more than just Glasgow. So through the summer, we're taking a roadshow around Scotland to rural areas that host generation infrastructure, host wind farms and hydro plants and solar farms and telling people about the contribution their area is making to the fight against climate change and telling them about COP as well, because it's easy for those of us in energy to think everybody knows that COP is coming and how important it is. And um, it's just not the case that the public understand that at the moment. I know that from speaking to my own friends and family. So that message is something we'll be taking out around the country uh, in the summer. So really excited about that as well. Um, I wanted to leave you with our message for COP, um, which I think is important in this context, which is that Scotland has spent 20 years decarbonizing its energy industry uh, while maintaining economic growth. We've now got the skills and the technologies that 
the rest of the world needs as it comes to decarbonize its own um, its own economy um, to meet its, its goals under the Paris Agreement. So that is, um, yeah, that's where I wanted to leave it. Scotland has those skills. Uh, we're ready to deliver. Um, if you'd like to get involved with any of this, with our year of COP work, then um, you can get hold of my email address from the website. I'll pop it in the chat too. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nick, for that re <clears throat> really comprehensive presentation. And uh, you pack so much into the short space of time there. But thanks for outlining the successes to date and, and outlining all the uh, potential opportunities and, and finishing with COP as well, which is really, really positive. So much in that. I'm conscious of time too. So I'll now hand over for uh, to Steve, uh, Steve Taylor, Chief Exec of Ideas, uh, who's also working on a project with Scottish Development International. Uh, just a wee reminder that if you've got any questions for the speakers, please put them in the chat box. I know there's a few points that we'll raise just at the end, but over to you in the meantime, Steve. Many thanks, Richard. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, this is an unusual talk for me. <laughs> I'm actually wearing two hats, so I'm going to give you a bit of talk about my experience of setting up a business in Germany, but also my new role, which I'll come on to and it will become clearer as we go through the presentation. Firstly, a bit about Ideas Limited, uh, a general environmental consultancy that I set up in Glasgow 2004. Uh, one of the things I really enjoyed was doing a lot of uh, research projects funded through European sources, took me to every country in Europe and a uh, fascinating experience, but learned so much about not just renewable energy, but other circular economy projects and so on. Um, immediately after the Brexit referendum, I was talking to someone I'd worked with for years and putting together a, another uh, project team. And he said, look, sorry, Steve, we'd love to have you in the team, but we're not having any UK partners at the moment because we don't know if we'll get funding for you. And that was it. I was out the door and I thought, well, got to do something about that. Um, so I decided I would uh, set up an office in Germany. And I think I was ready for a new adventure as well, but I thought the timing's right. Uh, I'll set up an office in Germany. It wasn't quite as straightforward as I'd hoped. Um, and I, need, I did need a good amount of help, and I'm pleased to say I did get help. But first of all, I thought, well, how do you go about setting up an office? Put that one in inverted commas, because I didn't really know what I was going to try and set up. I'd been working on a kind of contract basis where every project I worked on was just a contract for my Scottish company. Um, but what about setting up a new office um, or even a new company? And I think it was a, a comment which Herr Krauser said earlier, um, the importance of a GmbH, the GmbH. Um, that's the new company. And actually, when you spend a bit of time and take a bit of advice, uh, trying to set up a branch office of a Scottish company in Germany, um, it has quite a few disadvantages. So I went down the route of a new company. Um, I did consider going into partnership with a German company. I think that's a really, really good way forward. Um, I did find somebody, unfortunately, didn't work out. Um, but it's, it's hard to find uh, the right partner in, in, if you're a, a small business and uh, it's, it's a really important decision. I think it is a good way forward. And if you can find a good partner, uh, that's good. Otherwise, the potential to set up the business, um, it is relatively straightforward, a little bit time consuming. Um, but I would also say without that partnership, I will definitely have to employ at the right time a native German speaker. I don't think I could rely on uh, my ability to write reports in, in, in perfect German. Uh, two things covered really here. First of all, I wanted to open uh, before the Brexit date. Now that's obviously not relevant anymore, um, but it was important to me to open before Brexit. Um, because quite simply, if we go back a couple of years, we didn't know what would happen after Brexit. And I thought it's the worst thing that could happen is 1st of January 21, I'm told, oh, sorry, you're too late. Um, so I thought, make sure I am open before Brexit. And that uh, is something that I did achieve. The second thing I looked at was, where should I locate? My first thought was Berlin, and that was based on a good amount of research looking into where uh, potential employment opportunities might be. So working as a consultancy, working with other companies and clients. I've worked with quite a few people in and around Sachsen-Anhalt, which is just outside Berlin, uh, in Berlin itself. Other parts of Germany as well, but I felt in Berlin, the market's quite big. Um, it's a good place to have a headquarters and also it's a, it's a fun city to live. Uh, I also considered Nordrhein-Westfalen. No coincidence that I have my favourite building in Nordrhein-Westfalen in the, the 
picture there. Uh, any football fans uh, will know what first brought me to this area. Um, I came over for a football match in the late 80s. I got totally hooked by Borussia Dortmund, came regularly. And then in the 1990s, I discovered that this area, the Ruhrgebiet area of Nordrhein-Westfalen, it was a really exciting area. Uh, so much going on in the environmental sector. Um, a program called the IBAR, the International Baustellung, really motivated people in this area, got businesses and universities and everybody excited. A little bit like COP has got Glasgow excited this year. Uh, the IBAR really got uh, the rural to be excited back in the 90s. And I came over regularly. I started doing guest lectures at Dortmund University. Um, I then did an internship at uh, the city of Bochum, which was a great experience, quite an unusual thing for a professional person to do, but what a great experience. And I thought that this actually could be a great location for me to set up my business. But of course, all the time, the clock's ticking and I'm uh, thinking I've got to really get set up uh, by the end of December 2020. And how do you actually go about moving to another country? And in the end, I got help from a friend based in Frankfurt who was actually looking for somebody uh, to share their, their accommodation. <laughs> and it was an opportunity. And I thought the most important thing for me is to get an address. I have to get registered in Germany. If I want to live here, I have to get registered or angemeldet to use a local expression. Without that, I wouldn't be available to work. I wouldn't be eligible rather to work in Germany after the Brexit date. So it was the best decision I made. It was a technical kind of bureaucratic decision, um, but it got me registered. And that means I am now uh, able to work legally in Germany. I then went back to Nordrhein-Westfalen um, in order to set up the business. Uh, but that was partly on the back of a good conversation um, with a potential client. And he gave me a bit of advice. So I would call this my marketing research. He helped me prepare some presentation for a couple of potential clients in his area. And you'll notice that I've been a little bit, um, a bit of English, a bit of German on that slide. Uh, I'll let them know that I'm going to make an effort to speak in German. But there might be a few occasions where I slip back into English. But the market research I did, some, some key points came out. For an environmental consultancy, how am I going to win work in Germany? Well, obviously, to speak the language is very important. But <laughs> I particularly like this slide, the, I, the first slide I've ever had with the pictures of cows on it. But this was because a client was interested in turning uh, farm waste into energy through anaerobic digestion. So a little bit specific, let them know I've got some good experience in that background. The competition here is strict, it's severe. There's a lot of people doing the same kind of thing. So what could I bring in that's different, that uh, offers something a little bit, uh, maybe a bit more experience or something that's a little bit different? And talking through them, I discovered that this area of anaerobic digestion in this particular part of Germany, there was an area where they, were, where they were looking for a little bit of something slightly different, smaller scale AD plants. Uh, they didn't have any locally. This was an area where I had a little bit of experience and could help. So I made it on that a bit. More to the point, I wanted to keep it, um, demonstrate that our expertise in Scotland, our experience, which actually is very global, we're putting up pictures of the sustainable development goals is a very global aspect. But here we had a good, fun, innovative waste management project that I could talk about quite happily, that was very low carbon, that was different, a little bit of innovation. And that was something that made me stand out slightly from the competition. So um, very definitely focused on being a little bit different but also, one of the people I was speaking to wanted some expertise on, as it happened, it was a music festival. This is how I got involved in the first place, because I had a lot of experience of providing sustainability management at music festivals. So this is something where I come in and say, look, no one in Germany can match my experience in here. This is time to be big headed or to really promote yourself and uh, don't be shy, don't be afraid. Just say, I am the one who's got the experience. Look at the conditions that we have in Scotland, but we've kept these festivals open. Um, great experience. And look, this is global. There's even festivals in Africa we've worked at. Um, so we've got the experience. You don't have it locally. Um, I did say it slightly uh, more subtly than that. But I think the point is, get across the skills that Scotland has. And this is so important in the renewable energy sector, as we've heard from Nick's slide, um, Nick's presentation. There is so much we've got to offer. And this is a really, really important point to get across when we speak in Germany. I also wanted to um, demonstrate when I'm talking to potential German clients, a bit of innovation, a bit of fun, something a bit adventurous. And I always like the, the slide in the top right there because uh, there's some school kids in Malawi there sitting at desks. Well, those desks were made from the stage at a music festival in Malawi. I mean, that's 
that's not many people can say they've converted an old music stage into school desks. Great bit of sustainability work there, great bit of reuse of the material, but something very innovative, puts a smile on everyone's face when you hear that kids uh, manage to no longer have to sit on the floor when they're being taught, but can take, be considered a desk. It's got nothing to do with Germany, but it puts a smile on people's faces and lets them know that we've been working on some pretty innovative and some pretty adventurous projects. A bit less exciting than that. I had to knuckle down and get my head around things like lawyers, tax advisors. Um, there is help. I've received a hundred and something page document. Um, I know there are a few people on the call today who I'll, I'll mention later uh, who've uh, helped me with providing documents, providing lists of lawyers, tax advisors, and so on. Um, yeah, this was not quite as easy as I expected possibly because of timing. So last spring, just as the country was going into lockdown, I got a list of lawyers in the Dusseldorf area. And the first four I tried uh, were not able to help. I got a very polite, yes, uh, that person's working from home today, but they'll call you back. Um, and I didn't, uh, didn't get the, the service I expected. Um, I eventually got through to a lawyer. By now, I was kind of pretty desperate and I didn't think to check how much they were going to charge. I just said, yeah, let's get on with it. And it's got a bit of a shock when I got the bill at the end. They also explained that I needed to involve the services of a notar. Um, uh, I knew very little about this. Um, but what I would say is that picture there is so important. We don't do this in Scotland. We quite happily go to a company's house, set up a company, and it takes you a few minutes and there's a piece of paper stuck in the cupboard somewhere. It's very formal in Germany. That stamp is crucial. It's really vital and um, that is important for any business. You have to go through it. And I had to do a very, very formal, almost legal procedure of repeating after the, the notar. So things like this, things we have to get our head around. It's slightly uh, different to Scotland, uh, very formal, and we have to play by the rules in Germany or we'll get nowhere. Um, I think yesterday you heard about things like visas and permits. I've just told you a little bit about the, the marketing effort I made. But you put all this together, it takes a good bit of time. Um, it's not exciting work and it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, but eventually, working with the lawyers, I, uh, I did say, how long are you going to take to get this up and running? And I got a comment of, oh, it's about three months. And I said, yeah, that would take me beyond the Brexit deadline. Any chance of making it slightly faster than that? So any eagle eyes there might have spotted that my company was set up on the 30th of December 2020, uh, one day before the, de the Brexit deadline. And I had to go to their office um, after a 14 day quarantine. So I had to spend my, my Christmas uh, and New Year, my Christmas day in quarantine in order to hit the deadline. That's, uh, that, that's part of the things that I had to go through, but uh, very important to get this right. And no one wants to read a hundred page document um, but you know, you've got to go through it to understand what are the important factors, uh, skim read some of it, but getting the lawyers, the notars, the tax advisors, um, we have to get these in place before we can be a business again in Germany. So who can help? Well, you've heard yesterday from NRV Invest, from Germany Trade and Invest. Um, uh, today you've heard from the Energy Agentur from Nordrhein Westfalen. These are people who are there to help and I've spoken to all of them. They have all been very helpful. Uh, one person who, one organisation rather, who has not been mentioned that I'm aware of is the British German Chamber of Commerce, the AHK. Um, I found them very helpful. I was a member for uh, a few years based in Scotland. Uh, I believe that, that Max from, is on the call today who might be able to answer any questions that anybody wants on that. But I found them also very helpful. And then the one that I haven't mentioned there, Scottish Development International. Well, when I said I was wearing two hats, um, I set up the business in December, in the middle of a lockdown. Um, I had some Scottish clients to keep me going, uh, but really trying to uh, win new clients, despite all the, the promotional work that I did, um, that I referred to a few minutes ago, uh, I've actually put the business on hold and taken on a contract with Scottish Development International to help other businesses, such as the people on this trade mission, uh, to go through the same process that I've been through. Um, so for the next 12 months, I will be uh, helping by providing um, what is broken down into trade promotion, trade development, trade support. Uh, and what I mean by that, I think there's a few things that I've picked up today. So for example, um, Herr Linke mentioned the Supreme Court decision uh, in Germany, which is kind of, 
increase the targets. It's kind of said that um, the German government is not doing enough for the future generations. It's got to phase out fossil fuel quicker. So coal is going to close down quicker uh, than previously anticipated. This is huge. It's a big decision um, it's, it, and it will have a big impact because Germany will have to increase uh, the proportion of renewables in the energy mix. Coal will be phased out quicker. So there's things like this that are clear opportunities. Um, and what I want to try and be able to do is help um, companies such as yours from my new base in Berlin, uh, where SDI is based, and try and outline some of the things. So I mentioned the, 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 this is the federal court decision or the Supreme Court decision, but also uh, we've heard about the energy vendor or the energy transition, but the heat transition as well. This is really important. Um, there are 22 billion, uh, sorry, excuse me, 22 million buildings in Germany um, and 94%, I believe, are heated through fossil fuels, through oil, gas and coal. Well, what an opportunity that is. Nick mentioned how difficult it is for Scotland to get uh, the heat uh, decarbonized. Well, the opportunity in Germany is massive and the process has to speed up as a result of the federal court decision. There's also the new Renewable Energy Act that came in. It's called the Energy Act 2021, came in 1st of January. This is increasing targets, it's increasing opportunities and crucially is increasing funding for things like offshore wind, hydrogen, um, right across uh, renewable energy. So if, if people have questions, if people are looking for research, reports, contacts, statistics, we're in a position to be able to help with this. I think I've just um, put up a few things here, uh, just as a kind of a, an example. Um, the picture, the map of Germany highlights some of the new projects being put forward under the, under the, uh, the next round of funding. Anyone's interested in that, we can provide more information. Um, we can highlight things that we keep on top of, such as the Green Hydrogen Initiative of Northern Germany. I and mean, you can read this for yourselves. Uh, VARB is a Bremerhaven based uh, wind um, organization, which has a link with the Highlands. So some of you will be aware of, of VARB and what they can do. But there's also energy networks here that we can find out more about. We can provide information and getting involved in networks can be uh, a really positive uh, way forward. How long does it take? Um, yeah, from start to finish, it actually took me <laughs> best part of four years to set up my business in Germany. That's probably because I'm a small business trying to run uh, a business in Scotland at the same time, trying to do two things at once. Um, the, it did take a few stumbling blocks along the way. We had a few hiccups, um, but got there in the end. I would want to uh, say to people here, don't let that put you off. It probably won't take people uh, four years to get a business set up. And for some of you, it'll be looking at contracts, it'll be looking at partnerships, we'll be looking at something slightly different that could be quicker. But take advantage of the help that's around. I did, I found um, all the agencies that I mentioned previously were really helpful to me. Um, and in Nord Rhine-Westfalen in particular, the agencies there want you to operate in their area. And even for me as a very small business, as I said, I'm not going to come in and bring 500 jobs. They were still interested in me as a very small business coming to their area. Um, and my final slide, really, uh, just as I've now um, taken on the role with Scottish Development International and ideas will play a slightly more of a, a backseat and ideas, again, Beha will be on hold. Um, what can I do to help businesses in the renewable energy sector that want to win contracts in Germany? And I think ask questions. If you ask questions, I will do my best to, to answer them. I'm still new in post, it's still only two weeks, so I'm still finding out exactly my way around uh, the office, the office that nobody's in. Um, one of the, these, these are some things that we can try and do to help uh, and keeping you up to date. So some of the latest research, uh, engaging with stakeholders, the tender opportunities. Uh, someone previously today has already mentioned they'll be in German, so you might need some help mm -hmm. uh, with those. But we can we can get them across to you. We can highlight tender opportunities, highlight the events and webinars. Germany is the land of the Messe. People do business through the trade fairs. Um, obviously, they're not happening at the moment, but there's substitute events in place. These are really port, important and definitely well worth logging into. And we can update you, advise you, and provide the support to help you try and access um, some of these events. 
I think the one thing I would finish up by saying is contact us. Um, I've just started this new job. I'm excited about it. I want to be helping businesses and letting you know what we can do in Germany to help you access business opportunities in Germany. I've been through it myself. Um, it's dead exciting time and really ask me as many questions as you want and I will be doing my best to help. Many thanks. Steve, brilliant. Thank you for your unique um, experience there, um, wearing both those hats and always great to have a presentation that mentions football and music festivals. <laughs> that's, uh, that's always, always good fun. Yeah. Um, but no, seriously, um, brilliantly kind of uh, illustrating the partnership opportunities and, and the, you know, the many partners that we can have in Scotland and in Germany that can help. And thanks to Max from the British Chamber of Commerce Germany, who's on the call and has got his details there. And I know that we have been speaking to the chamber um, uh, in the run up to COP26, and we can maybe talk about that in more detail offline, but there's lots of exciting opportunities around that. Um, I hope you've been as inspired and informed as I have this morning. Um, we've had some excellent speakers. We've got time for just a very couple of quick questions. Um, Ruth had asked a question for Stefan. Um, on your hydrogen slide, you mentioned salt caverns. Do you know how much capacity there is and where you could find this out, Stefan? Are you able to come in on that one? Um, no, I'm not really able to give the exact numbers. So, so she should look uh, at the sites of the BGR. I sent her an email. The BGR, the federal body for, for ground research and resources research, and that they have lists of caverns, what's in for oil, gas, uh, maybe hydrogen. I think there's one test site in Germany where you, where hydrogen is now operating with caverns. Uh, uh, there she will find a list of all these caverns, the sizes, uh, the cubic meters, and so on. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Yes, and we'll make sure that we share all the information that's been captured on the chat. So I know that Stefan has sent that that link to the to the, the hydrogen roadmap as well. Um, so if we haven't managed to get round to any of your specific questions, uh, we can do that offline and we can certainly share the presentations with everybody this morning as well. Um, thank you for all the positive feedback. I know Neil had asked a question, which I know Nick has now come back to answer. Um, so I think probably, uh, unless we've got any other final questions, um, I would like to wrap up and just thank all of our speakers and partners. As I said before, I found it excellent, insightful, inspiring this morning. Um, I think the point that was made yesterday is that from a Scottish point of view, we are keener than ever to work with partners in Europe, and particularly in Germany. Um, one of the recurring themes this morning has been local partnerships and, and really, really well illustrated by Carsten and, and, and the partnerships with Logan um, Energy, which is excellent. Um, Nick illustrated all the, all the expertise and opportunities in Scotland and we've had some great case studies and thank you to Steve as well. Um, I've, I've got lots of thank yous here so bear with me just for a second. Um, I, I have to say thank you to Minister McKee uh, and also to uh, Dr Professor Pinkbart. Um, we have to say um, big thank yous to um, particularly to Stefan Magdalena at Energy Agenteur, NRW, uh, to Carsten and Elegen, to Nick and Scottish Renewables, and to Steve Ideas, to our partners at Scottish Government, uh, SDI and Scottish Chambers of Commerce, to Germany Trade and Invest, uh, and to Dagmar at NRW Global. Thanks also to Max at British Chamber of Commerce Germany, um, and also to, um, particularly to Alexandra Steen, and to uh, um, uh, Johannes Augustin at SDI as well. Um, and I suppose from our point of view, we just want to, want to uh, give you all best wishes in your B2B meetings, uh, which I know you've had some of them yesterday and you have more um, today. We will be following up on those business to business meetings and um, measuring the impacts and out outcomes. Um, we're very excited about the opportunities and thank you to, uh, to the teams for organizing all the meetings from Energy Agenda, um, and also the opportunities around COP26. We're working on a, a mega inward trade mission uh, during COP from Glasgow Chamber of Commerce, working with British Chambers of Commerce overseas. We have 
partnerships with 11 overseas chambers of commerce and we're happy to provide more information for anybody that would like to find out more about that and i just say a massive thank you to all of our speakers this morning and to all of our partners and to wish you well please keep in touch and best wishes for all the b2b meetings thank you again for an inspiring morning thanks guys bye bye for now